All right, welcome back. So in this next video, I'm going to load up a data set of a mite. In fact, it's two data sets, two image channels. Um, the same mite scanned at different resolutions uh, to demonstrate correlative imaging, basically, which is quite easy in, or quite uh, correlative capabilities in Dragonfly is quite powerful. So you can actually import data from many different uh, imaging modalities and uh, instruments into the same workspace and register and align them. So in this case, uh, it's like a follow on from the previous video, I will continue with some visualization and some, um, some of the basics as well. So let's load up. In this case, it's an object. So we're importing objects. It's called multimite.ors object. In this case, it's giving me the body scan and the head scan. So it was already prepared for me before. And um, this was a scan, I think, performed by Nicola Pichet on a Zeiss um, machine. So what we have is we have two image, two scans here, two um, items, two objects on the right over here. You can see the difference, the body scan um, is 13 by 16 by 8 millimeters and the head scan is 4 by 4 by 3 millimeters. So if we show the head, now it's not in the field of view. So one way to easily do that is to right click and align this, the, with the current view. So there we see the head. This is what the high resolution scan looks like. And the low resolution scan looks like that. So if we toggle like that, we see both. A better way of toggling is to make the body uh, op opaque a little bit. So we go to Windows leveling, and make it less, less opaque, I mean, slightly transparent. So there we see the underlying data. Um, so the two, you're seeing both channels here on top of each other, and they are not perfectly aligned. They're quite well aligned, but not perfect. So um, that's something that we can look at a little bit. So if we do that, we can optimize that still a bit if we're interested in doing that. So um, yeah, while I'm there, we can just as well do that. Let's move the head relative to the rest. Let's say um, if we, let's, we, I showed you earlier the translate rotate tool. So. If you, I didn't say, I didn't explain previously, if you click on the move tool, you can use the, the keyboard arrow buttons to move small amounts. And that seems to be slightly better. So there we go. That seems slightly better. If we toggle between them as well, we can see that's, that's quite nice in this area at least. So to get out of the translate rotate um, state, we press the escape button and now we have the two aligned in, in the coordinate system. So at the moment, this is just a 2D view. We'd like to go to the quad view, which you find under layout, and we'd like to view both of them. So at the moment, we've got two data sets viewed at the same time here, both showing black pixels. So let's... Um, there we go, that's the body. So I've just contrasted slightly to show this mite in 3D. Let's um, double click to get the full view. And let's look at him face, face on. <laughs> okay, so um, at the moment it's quite dark. So it's a 3D view, so we have extra 3D render buttons that one which makes it slightly easily Brighter is tone mapping. We can also use diffuse lighting and specular lighting. And we don't really need shininess. It's not making a difference here, actually. The tone mapping makes a difference. Each data set is slightly different in terms of what 3D renders work well. Um, in this case, um, let's try the bones render. It's slightly brighter. And then we can, from there, still tune it further. As you can see, there's some lighting coming from the um, top right, which we can change. We can change the lighting under the window leveling tools. 
no, sorry, scenes view property. So we can change the angle of the lighting there. And we can then um, zoom in slightly. Uh, what we can do is this rendering is depending very much on the, the, con the window leveling. So let's look at it on a log scale. What we'd like to do is bring this closer. So we narrow the, the range across which we're viewing it and we can change the gamma across that. So um, that is okay. I think we can also do that. That makes it look better. So we're having black closer to the left and that gives you easily the texture. So there's actually an interesting texture on this mite and a lot of uh, nice surface detail visible there. So um, this is quite nice. Let's see what else we can, I can demonstrate to you here. Obviously maximize quality. This gives a slightly higher quality image. Uh, we can also change the background color. This makes things stand out slightly more sometimes. Um, the white is good as a um, white to black. We can make it maybe less um, strong gradient like that. Uh, we can also make different background colors there. Um, you can also make edge detect, which makes a, a contour around the edge. So it might be interesting in some cases. Uh, what else? Anti-aliasing doesn't make much difference here. Um, and then you can play around with the lighting options, deepen shadows. It actually shows up more of the, um, of the texture and you can make the shadow opacity more or less. So the, yeah, that's quite a nice rendering we've got there. And let's see on the right, we have solidity. This makes a big difference, usually. Um, the preset reduced the solidity, which is not always a good idea. Here we have a brighter, more lighting, brighter lighting. Um, what else? Cubic interpolation, yes. This makes interesting. Uh, what I wanted to dem demonstrate, and I'm glad I remember this now. By the way, these legends, I don't know if I mentioned before, you can move them around like this. You can also decide to, uh, if you right click on it, make it a vertical legend. So that's quite easy. Um, we might want to have an orthographic projection in this case. And um, let me just put this legend away. I don't want it in this image. So in this case, we're having a scale bar of one millimeter there, which is quite nice. Okay, so what I wanted to show you is there's a very nice um, virtual floor option, which we can, let's, I don't know how well it works on the mic. Let me just try it here. So we wanted the floor to be on the Z axis. So on the positive Z axis, it's like a glass floor, which is making a reflection. So if I move this, you see quite nicely, you can make some artistic pictures with a reflected um, let's make rather along the positive X axis sort of behind it. This might look better. So it's actually got a shadow in addition and you can change the the reflective surface like this. You can change the color of it. You can change how far it is away. So 
So I think it's clear we can make different um, options here. If you put the lighting off in this case, you get a brighter picture without the shadow and you can move around the shadow by moving around the lighting like this. Yeah, that's not, that, that's a good one. So uh, actually I would like this to be, yeah, that's actually more reflective surface and yeah, you can play around with that. That can make quite nice um, visualization. Um, and changing the position of this, for example, in the negative Y, sort of behind it like that. So you can see the front and the back side at the same time. I guess the best, the easiest is in the Z axis, where it's sort of a glass floor below the object. And you, oh, I, what I didn't explain yet is you can turn the, it's not just in a particular axis, you can turn this plane and fine tune it using these little sliders on the left here. So that's quite nice. Let's say I would now want to export this image here. Let's say I'm happy with this and I want to export this image. Um, at this point, um, I want to take away these text annotations. So what, we, what do we do? We go to, um, I think it's the scenes view properties. Let's just scroll down here and put the text annotations away. And what we do, what I usually do is I right click and export screenshot of view. So the default values are there, but we can go up to about 4,000 on the width and the height then is automatically saved. And the alpha background is if you want only the object without any background, if you want to put it on top of some other image, the default is without that. So we just save that as, for example, nice 3D. Pick and it's a tough file, and that should be quite a nice image. Um, actually, we can go and have a look at it. I think it's under downloads. Yeah, it's 34 megabytes file, and it's looking like this. So, all right, let's go back to visualization. What else did I want to show you on the mic? Let's put off the, the glass floor, the virtual floor for now. It slows things down, slows rendering down a bit. So um, what I want, what I didn't show yet is the shortcut. Um, if you press, there's a number of shortcuts that you can define using preferences, many shortcuts. So if you want in 3D view, for example, to see the tip of this thing here, when you, you can press the two, the number two, and click in that location. And there it jumps already to that. And now you can refine it a little bit with the crosshairs like this. And that's a quick way of jumping to that position. Um, what else? Let me see what else I wanted to demonstrate. Okay, we've got the body and the head. Let's make, let's visualize the head in the same way. So we've got, um, let's make the, the 3D, we need to click on the 3D window to view it, the 3D settings. The head is also a um, bones preset at the moment. So actually wait, let's just visualize it in 3D. It's not at the moment the same. So let's make it a bones preset as well. And let's increase the opacity and we make the body 
transparent. So we reduce the solidity and we um, reduce the opacity of that. Um, where is it? It's under Windows leveling. There it is. So if we look at that and we can actually make the interior, the head, slightly different colors by, um, for example, we go onto this or this, any one of these um, control points. We can change that color to be more orange in color. And we can change each one of these control points and the gradient. Let's make it slightly brighter orange. And even, I mean, this, this is probably not going to make much difference, this one, making this red because this is the part that's not really visualized that much. This is below the visualization. But if we have a look at, yeah, let's make this, this one slightly, slightly more red, a red orange color or more red color. That's quite a nice visualization. And we can increase that um, lighting on it. It's not making much difference there. So you can play around with these render settings. Um, the body itself has now different um, solidity. In the new version coming in September, there's a nice slider, which uh, is called the edge contrast slider, which helps to visualize um, transparency, change the transparency better. But for now, this is enough changing the, the solidity and the opacity playing with these two. So opacity can be made quite low and solidity, actually solidity lower and opacity higher. Mm, that's, that's quite nice. I would say the head needs to be um, brighter actually, but this is due to the color. There we go. That's, that's already quite better. So some, um, just some settings on visualization, which is quite nice to play around with. You can also, of course, switch that totally off, um, reduce its opacity entirely and just visualize the head section like this. So actually the, the rendering on the head part itself, I don't know if I explained it, you need to drag this um, um, to visualize, to, to change the contrast over it. That was actually quite a nice contrast just a minute ago. So now it's showing more detail on the head, some texture and so on. So if you drag this further to the left, you see more until you see eventually the air around it, which we don't want. This is quite a nice render setting. And something I didn't show yet, and I'd like to do that quickly, is if you have a nice picture like this, you might want to add a focus to it. It's a got at the moment autofocus, apparently, which uh, this is because we have two functions. Let me just see why is it not visible at the moment. Hmm. There's usually a focus button there. I think it might be due to a combination of presets and um, it's not really that important. It's just to um, show a um, a certain area in focus and the rest blurred out. So it might be due to the lighting used or due to the opacity used. So um, I did by accident now a change of view mode, but actually that's quite nice. It's giving us a nice 
uh, view at this high resolution. So, okay, this, let's see what else can I show you. What I would like to do in this at this point maybe is crop this object open to see the inside. One way to do it is to use simplest ways to use this clipping box. So you click on the clipping box and you have this box that's visible in 3D. So if you now drag this, you clip open the object. And this, the, the clipping functions are accessible by opening the visual effects and you can apply this clipping box, the same clipping box to the head and the body or one of them or both in any order. You can, at the moment it's doing a clipping and it can do either inside or outside clipping. So that depends on your data set. You might have to click on the outside in order to clip the correct side of it. Uh, that you can also change opacity and do other things to the one part of the data and not the other part. So um, that's where to find that function. And you can also make very nice videos where this is the first frame and this is the last frame. Uh, we'll get to the movie maker later, but just as you can make a rotation video, you can make a clipping uh, or cropping video like this. So this um, uh, clip box, which I'm showing you here, if you would like, if you're quite happy with this section that you've got here, for example, and you now want to create a small data set of that, what you can do is you can right click and modify and transform and uh, crop. This, these values are now automatically selected on this box and you can create a new data set. So you have a new cropped head, which is the same exact area, but no other pixels. So it's a smaller, smaller part. So these are all um, flexible ways of doing things. Um, I'm trying to show a lot of things at the same time. Let's move away from the 3D view and let's move to the 2D window again. So what, what I wanted to show here was the ruler. And one nice way to do it is across um, the 2D and 3D data. So across the same feature. So on the left, we have um, a number of, it's uh, closed down Windows leveling annotation tools. So this annotation annotate panel has points. Let's start with the points before we get to the ruler. Let's say we select there a point, there a point, there a point, there a point, and so on. Each of these points is saved uh, into a, a single item there. So it's called points one. Uh, I can give it a different name. I can say these are the surface head locations. And all of these are now uh, saved with the um, position coordinates. And you can save once you are done with all your selections, you can add more points adding by uh, keeping the control button pressed and the um, left click of the mouse. Once you have your list of points, you can then export this to a CSV file or whatever file you're interested in. Or JSON, I'm not sure. So CSV is most widely used, I guess. And um, that's for defining certain points. Now, if what I wanted to do was I wanted to do a ruler, a demonstrator ruler. So let's say we are interested in this particular area here. We want to measure across it. So you could either, I mean, a ruler mainly is used to measure distances. Let's demonstrate that over here. Let's say we are interested to measure the distance from here there to there. That's very nice. We have a measurement of 0 0.87. So just a note here, th this measurement is following sub-voxel. It's not following voxel edges or anything like that. At the moment, 
if we show the pixels, I don't know if this is visible in Zoom, maybe I should just contrast it a bit better. At the moment, we are seeing the pixels there, the, the blocks. So this, uh, let me just undo that last ruler. Let's just delete it. If we go back to the second one here and we select it, you can move that point, the measurement location anywhere within voxels and it's measuring sub voxel distances. It's not measuring to the edge of a voxel. Um, what I actually wanted to demonstrate here was on the first ruler, a, the, um, then we've got the, the head and the body here. So the, they have different brightness and they have different um, scan quality, basically. If we are highlighting or clicked on the ruler, we can click on profile intensity here at the bottom. So what this allows us to do is we can see the, the, um, the um, two different profiles, put the red off. We've got the head and the body. The head is the high resolution scan. It's the purple color here. And the body is the green one. So we can see that they are not perfectly aligned and they have different sharpness or, or steepness of the profile. So we can align using this so let's say we go to the translate rotate tools. We can now rotate, we can move this. We're actually moving, we need to move the head. We need to move the head. So if we're doing that, there we're moving the head. You can see the intensity profile is moving. We're moving it in the wrong direction there. We want to align the head. Where's my intensity profile now? Let's do it again. I think... Uh, oh, there. We need to do an intensity profile. Oh, we've still got it. It just uh, minimized itself. Um, they were moving away, let's move the opposite direction. So I think you get the you get the idea. So you can use. I, I just wanted to demonstrate the line profile. Basically, not it's not always used for alignment, but it's quite a useful tool to understand your data and to see um, to compare different data sets to each other. So there we we're quite close. Probably I moved past it now. My computer might be doing things in the background. And I think I'm downloading data or something. So, okay, the important thing here is, let's say we're interested in this profile here. You can take this profile um, and we can, let's just make it slightly smaller so that we can see the panels below it. So we can save this image as a, a figure file, or we can export the data to a CSV file so you can keep that on record or use it for um, plotting data. You can also, um, this is 100 points, you can also take 200 points or you can downscale it to take less points. Um, we can also use, um, it's taking a point by point here. You can also take a disk of a certain diameter to uh, even out across a little area. So it's a, a way of averaging out across the image, across adjacent pixels, um, perpendicular to the line that you're working along. And uh, I think that's all I wanted to demonstrate here. All right. Um, 
what we can do is, I think that's everything. Oh, something I, I didn't show yet, but which was in the, in the training before was if we have multiple data sets with multiple legends like this, let's go, let's go to the, um, show the legends again. We can actually show multiple legends at the same time. There's no problem. You can have four legends actually. Um, so you can have many legends at the same time. You don't need to um, limit yourself. So this is the body and this is the head grayscales. What else? Um, oh, we're still on the annotate tools. There's a number of others here. You can measure angles like this. There's also a four point angle. So you define or multiple angles. Oh, I, this is, this is um, 46 degrees between these two here. Um, then there's a path. So you can, let's go to another location here. Let's say we can do this. And you can measure the total distance along that path or you can do um, a number of different, different things. You can check the intensity along that path. And uh, let me see, where is that? You can actually um, extract data set from path. That's, I'm not gonna go into that here. There's, this is a bit more on the advanced side. So what we can do, something I haven't shown yet is the probe tool, which is quite important. Um, I'm still with the annotations. I will come back to some of those now, but there's something called a probe tool, which um, there's different ways of probing. A single pixel level, you can, if you have your mouse and click in any location, you get a value, a grayscale gray value, X, Y, Z position, and um, you can check comparatively to different locations and you can use a region. So that gives you an average over that little region uh, in 2D. Um, there's a square probe that also gives you different, and you can, by the way, all functions which are like this, which are also useful for segmentation in Dragonfly, you can enlarge and in, make it sm larger and smaller by control and scroll button, which might be obvious to some, but not to all. Okay, so I think that's um, almost done. What we need to, there's still an arrow tool. So you might want to demonstrate something with an arrow, make a little arrow annotation. You can, there's at the moment no head on this arrow. That's not correct. There's an arrow head and we can make the arrow head size larger. We can uh, change the coloring and the thickness and things on this. So you can make arrows to, to in, in your pic images to highlight certain features. And by using this little circle, you can turn the arrow and point it at the front and back or move the whole arrow around like this. Um, what else? On the annotate, on the, there's a square annotation. So you can make a square annotation, this region. We use this, um, these kind of regions. Let's just zoom out a bit. Let's say, for example, we're interested in what's going on in the middle of this mite here. Um, this region, we can actually do a histogram on it. This is now the, the grayscale distribution within this rectangle or region four alone. You can copy that to clipboard, you can save it to CSV file and so on. Um, we also use these regions as um, later for defining frames to view deep learning um, progression. Right. Oh, something else I wanted to demonstrate. By the way, we can delete all of these unnecessary things, hi highlight all of them using 
the shift and click and then click on the dustbin to delete it. Right, so now we have the head again. What we can do is we can do something fancy here where on the scene view panel, let's just go down. Uh, at this point, we don't, we're viewing slice at the moment. So we can do also something different. We can use maximum or minimum intensity projection. If we use maximum, that means along a number of slices, it's going to select the brightest pixel along a number of slices. So it's like a, an, an averaging out. And we can see that um, usually along the other axes, but now we have multiple images open at the same time. So let me just get the, the views um, refreshed and reset. Okay, so now we, we have a reset view of the head. Let's put the 3D view off. It's distracting us a bit. So let's go, we are highlighting this. Let's, let's highlight this view here. We want to make it a, a minimum intensity projection. So we, a maximum intensity projection like this. And Ah, there we go. So for some reason, we were not in the track mode. So if we're in this view and we having a, a maximum intensity projection, we have these dotted lines in the other view. So this is the region across which the maximum intensity projection is taken. So you can take this and widen it out. And then you see basically a, a thick slab or a maximum intensity projection across a number. This highlights things like hairs in this case. So you can see more of these little hairs because they are, they are now all being viewed within the same, uh, a number of slices, like hundred slices at the same time in one image. This is quite useful in some cases for minimum intensity projection. For example, if you're looking at porosity in, a, in, a, in a, some object, and you want to see if the pores are all located along the left of the object and you're viewing it from the, from the top, for example. Okay, so I think that's everything for this video. And um, then in the next video, we will be moving on to a cube with porosity, if I remember correct. Okay, thank you.